Renan, you are a professor at uh, Columbia University, and uh, even though you're French, I mean, you have been working in the States for many years now, and uh, you try to make the link between uh, adult neurogenesis, the formation of new neurons in the adult, and uh, depressive states in, in the human, right? I mean, uh, yes. what can you tell us about that? Well, we, we were interested in, um, in the origins of depression, in how antidepressants work, why they take a long time to work. As you may know, most antidepressants take weeks to, to reach maximum clinical efficacy. So uh, what we took advantage of is the fact that uh, Ron Duman, about 20 years ago, had shown that antidepressants stimulate the production of new neurons in the dentate gyrus, which is a part of the hippocampus. So that attracted our attention because Obviously, if you stimulate the production of new neurons, you have a built-in delay in, uh, in efficacy because these neurons need to differentiate, integra integrate into the circuit. So that's, that's what gave us the idea that neurogenesis in the hippocampus may be responsible for the because delay. Because the antidepressants you are using were supposed to act immediately? No, but uh, we knew that they were working slowly in humans. And none of the biochemical mechanisms that had been studied was, were, were, were so slow. For example, SSRIs that increase, uh, serotonin increase serotonin levels and activate serotonin receptors work biochemically rather fast. So why, if you have a fast increase in serotonin, do you have such a delay in onset of therapeutic efficacy? So that's what led to the sort of neurotrophic hypothesis which was that downstream of serotonin, there would be growth-related effects. It could have been anything else. I mean, why, why uh, neurogenesis? Yes, and I think at the end of the day, what we're probably going to find is that neurogenesis is one of the contributors, but synaptic plasticity in other parts of the brain is also going to be a contributor. So there is now evidence for both neurogenic effects of SSRIs, but also dendritic and... So if this is so, I mean, any uh, uh, drug that would modify neurogenesis should have an effect on uh, the depressive state of the patient, right? Yeah, and that's something that to a large extent is true. Most manipulations that stimulate neurogenesis in the hippocampus, at least in animal models, have antidepressant effects. Running, for example? Running is one of the most effective Smoking? antidepressants. Smoking doesn't actually increase neurogenesis. But what she said this morning, our friend uh, Fiona Dutch, right? Well, Fiona said that some nicotinic and some muscarinic receptors may modulate the niche. Okay. But here we are talking about the hippocampus. Not so the we should not resume zone. smoking? No, I don't think okay. there is any evidence that smoking stimulates neurogenesis in the hippocampus. But we should start running? We should definitely start running. And actually, there are a few clinical studies that show that running has antidepressant effects. The problem is when somebody is terminally depressed, Impressive. it's very difficult to get them on the treadmill. So running is only going to be effective for people who are capable of physical activity. Or who are well, not yet completely depressed. That's right. Okay. So I think at the end of the day, we're probably going to need a mixture of uh, medications to initiate the process. But then maybe running is going to become but one of the... But could you see a decrease in uh, neurogenesis in depressed people? you see uh, a decrease in neurogenesis in all animal models of depression. Okay. Stress models, um, genetic models. In human, it's much harder because we have one problem in human is that we can't measure neurogenesis in the live human brain. So that's still something that's unresolved. The only way we can detect neurogenesis is post-mortem. So when somebody is dead, you have to cut their brain and analyze the number of stem cells and progenitors in their hippocampi. And there, there is some correlation, but these post-mortem studies are basically not precise enough. So one of the big areas of investigation now is to find a marker for human neurogenesis that you can actually do while the person is taking, let's say, an antidepressant or running to see whether there is basically an increase that correlates with uh, the alleviation of depression symptoms. But you could also screen for all drugs that may modify neurogenesis in the animal and see whether some of these drugs have an antidepressive effect on the human, right? Yeah, that's exactly what we are doing actually because one of the problems with SSRIs is that they target many serotonin receptors. There are in mammals about 15 serotonin receptors. 
and there are only a few of these that are useful to stimulate neurogenesis. So the idea is to get to manipulations that are much faster. Another thing we really try to, to get to is not stimulate the proliferation, because if you stimulate the proliferation, it's still going to take two weeks for these neurons to integrate the it's circuits. not too bad, you know, two weeks. Yeah, but if you could have something that works within hours, like ketamine, uh, that would be much uh, desirable for people who have to wait often a month to see whether a drug works or not, then take another one, wait again a month to see whether it works or not. Well, this brings you to another question. I mean, do we need to have new neurons integrated in new circuits to fight the uh, depression? Well, so that brings us to sort of the other area what, which we are studying now actively, is what's the role of these new neurons in the dente gyrus? How do they change the circuit? And the model that we are currently developing is that these new neurons in the dente gyrus help the process of pattern separation. Pattern separation is a process that allows us to discriminate between similar situations. And that's a process that's very useful for learning, but it's also a process that allows us to discriminate between something that's safe and something that's not safe. People who are anxious, who are depressed, tend to, uh, tend to be bad at pattern separation. The way it's often referred to in the psychiatric literature is that... Being anxious and depressed is the same thing? Well, there is a lot of comorbidity. About 50% uh, of people who show up with anxiety symptoms at some point in their lifetime are also going to have depression and vice versa. So it's almost like depression and anxiety could be manifestations of the same disorder but at different periods in your life. Okay, well, thank you very much. It was very interesting for all of us who are both anxious and depressed. Well... But not at the same time. Well, neurogenesis increases could actually help both uh, situations. Okay. Do you know of anyone who was never depressed and never anxious in his life? No, but the way it's defined clinically sort of is, uh, as you know, on, an, on, a, on a continuous scale sort of. So the normal anxiety that you express in the face of danger or in the face of aversive situations is adaptive. That one you don't want to get rid of, otherwise you're going to be run over by a car the first time you cross the street. Uh, it's really the continuous prolonged anxiety, the one that's no longer connected okay. with the environmental situation that you are in, that is problematic and that needs to be helped. Well, this is very useful and uh, I thank you a lot for giving this little interview to the lay people and also to the specialists listening to what happens at the Collège de France. Thank you. My pleasure.